We're joined by, on the, on the platform here, uh, Dr. Noel Sharkey, Chair of Stop the Killer Robots, and he's also Chair of Computer Science at Sheffield University. Bertolt Meyer, who is Senior Research Associate, University of Zurich, and Carol Cadwallader, who is columnist with The Observer, who has written an article or two about the implications of artificial intelligence. Now, before we start, we're going to, you and I are going to get up and talk to this chap. Uh, well, you're going to tell us about him, first of all. Uh, this, this is about as good as it gets in terms of robots, isn't it? Well, this is definitely not how good as it gets in terms of, of robots. If we'd set out to build a fully, human, uh, fully functional robot that's not constrained by you know, humanoid specs, it would have looked not as dystopian as this does. Um, and it can't do that much. But th the idea of this was to showcase what technology and science has come up with so far in terms of replacement parts for the human body. So uh, this bionic man consists of artificial organs and prosthesis that are available right now or are about to become available. So to maybe give you a quick rundown from top to bottom, if I take up of his cap. He had, his head is a skull implant that's used to replace bone fractions that have been lost in accidents. Um, here we have cochlear implants that send sound signals into uh, the ear. Uh, what we have here is probably, uh, it's not Google Glasses, but it's something not so um, dissimilar. Um, it's a retinal implant system with a tiny camera here it's for people who've lost their vision but whose retina is still, well, not so really much functioning anymore, but they still have a visual nerve. So this camera creates an image that is transmitted through this violet transmitter into the retinal implant, which then sends the image into the brain. So it can give and can restore sight to the blind, at least under certain conditions. What we have here is a biocompatible artificial trachea, um, which can be used in the treatment of, of cancer, uh, people who had throat cancer and had their windpipe removed. So uh, this is like, imagine this like a very fine sponge in which stem cells grow, and then you have this kind of mixture between an artificial uh, nanotechnological something that is soaked with stem cells and is then implanted into the patient and then the patient's own cells attach to it and grow over it, and so it becomes accepted by the body. We have an artificial heart. Uh, Rob, could you switch, give this to life? So this is an artificial heart that is today already used in uh, patients who are waiting for a heart transplant, but do not make it in time to reach the heart transplant, so this is then implanted to bridge the time for them until a heart transplant becomes available. There's an external hydraulic pump that circulates the blood, and uh, the blood that actually circulates through here is, is a new kind of prototype version of artificial blood. It's, nanotechno it's nanotechnology, it's nanoparticles that actually bind oxygen particles and can give off oxygen particles. This is actually oxygenated uh, artificial blood, if you, uh, if you will. Quite hard work uh, living with this. Oh yes, very much so. You're ba basically confound it to the space of the hospital. I mean, you can and, and, walk and, around and a little bit. And the noise is... It's, yes. It's, mm. Of course, this, isn't, this is not a very pleasurable way to live. I mean, but this is an emergency device mm. that, can extend, that can extend life. We have an artificial prototype artificial lung, pre-prototype artificial spleen, artificial pancreas, artificial kidney, um, prototype of an artificial implantable kidney. Um, of course, imagine the possibilities. Then artificial foot and ankle system down here, artificial knees. Uh, both of these are computerized um, and uh, use a lot of sensors to determine whether the person is walking, running, stopping, standing. A robotic exoskeleton, the REX, this is com comes from New Zealand which is uh, supposed to give back uh, ability to walk for uh, people with spine injuries, paraplegics, um, and so forth. And then, of course, in the end, arm prosthesis. Um, this is the Utah arm system, and here we have the most advanced artificial hand prosthesis that's currently available on the market. It's the same model that I'm wearing. It's the uh, iLimb uh, Ultra Revolutions from a small startup company here in the UK, actually, um, uh, up in Scotland. Um, and 
it's fully articulate. It can move all of the, thing, the fingers. It has built-in pressure sensors. It has a Bluetooth interface. There's an app on my mobile phone with which I can control the hand, change the settings, and so forth. Yeah. Amazing. Um, uh, well, I'm actually interested, first of all, in you and the extent to which your own prosthetic has informed your building of the robot. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, the, um, well, my own prosthetics, of course, um, makes m me have a bit of an emotional connection with this being because we share two very visible physical features. On the one hand side, the hand. Were you born without, without an arm? Right, I'm sorry, of course. Yeah. I was born uh, without my lower part of my uh, left arm. It's a congenital condition. Uh, it's very rare, one in 100,000 births. Um, and I was fitted with various uh, And how processes. long have you had this British system? Well, th this very current one, only for four weeks, uh, pr previous version of this for about three years now. I mean, it's amazing that it's here. Not, uh, you come from Zurich, and one yes. would expect you to be building these things. <laughs> Well, I am, I'm a social psychologist. The research that I'm actually doing is on diversity, being different. So research is, I guess, also a bit of me search. You there. want to be the only man in Zurich with a British... I am gun. actually, I am actually, because I was the first to convince my health insurance to pay for it, because <laughs> these things are outrageously expensive, and it took me more than a year of fighting with them to mm. get it. Now, could I just speak to the robot Oh, sorry, I s yeah, I forgot to mention, of course he doesn't have a brain. Uh, we tried to use some software that's currently available. So his, his prejudices are your prejudices? No, well, they actually, the, so the, the software that's behind it won a, won a competition by pretending to be a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. Right. That's, that's all that we found, you know? Okay. To, so well, you, can try. I ask him? Um, yeah, he has speech recognition and sound. Yeah. Uh, what's the point of you? Bringing scientists together to take medical technology in new directions. Uh, let, let's just explore this bringing science yes. together, because obviously this debate is going to be a you know, whether artificial intelligence and the rest is, is, is going to take us out of control eventually and this whole idea of perhaps, you know, developing prosthetics that are better than our own limbs and the rest of it. So I, I, I'm wondering what kind of cooperation can you point to that wouldn't have existed if this guy hadn't been built? The scientific teams that are behind the organs here, especially the more prototype ones, they were unaware of each other and their work. And now we have the people who built, through this project, who built this pancreas and the people who built the trachea working together to make uh, the artificial pancreas more body compatible in the near future. That's so, amazing. They didn't yes. know of each other. No, no, they didn't. And they, they didn't only, know anything about their own... No, they only they, met through... They live the, in silos. They, <laughs> they do, actually, yes. They live in silos. And this project, which was part of a documentary, has brought them together. Let me just check one more question. Um, who is Eric Schmidt? He is a mysterious and magnificent person, and his magnificence is only exceeded by his mysteriousness. <laughs> I should say, I, I did ask him how much tax Google paid, but he didn't know the answer, so... <laughs> uh, let, let's sit down, Bertolt, and, uh, and engage. Um, well, uh, Dr. Saki, what's so terrifying about what you've just seen? Well, nothing, really. But you've got a whole campaign to try and destroy these people. No, not, not at all, no. Uh, the campaign, and by the way, let me correct that I'm actually chairman of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, not the killer robots. Um, <laughs> but, there, but, uh, but we're part of the leadership for a campaign that was launched in Parliament in April, uh, which is called the kill, Stop the Killer Robots, because we wanted to get the idea across to the public. But it's got it Amnesty... It feels quite the same. It's got Amnesty yeah. International, it's got Human Rights Watch, it's got a bunch of Nobel laureates and Article 36 and other big NGOs involved. And really, what it's about is about autonomous lethal weapons. And there we're talking about not autonomous robots. I've got an autonomous vacuum cleaner, and I'm not going to have that prohibited. So we're looking for an international prohibition. It's like drones, except they make their own decisions about who to kill. So they target, and this is very close now, they can target themselves and decide who to kill. And it's just that kill function we're trying to get banned. Um, so this has nothing to do with that. I mean, I'm, I've been working in robotics for most of my working life, about 30-odd years, and, and AI. So I'm not against AI and robotics. It can have very positive effects for society. Carol, what alarms you about this character? It's just, I mean, it's quite spooky sitting underneath a replica of um, Berto's face. I mean, it's actually this close. You can see it Better looks shape. like s sweat on the skin. Shaves He's perspiring. Well. He's got stage fright, so... The, I mean, I think this, this question of how we're going to interact with robots is very interesting. And 
that day is coming. And there's, so there's, there's lots of um, very useful ways that we might be seeing robots being used. For example, they're talking about as nursing assistants or in elder care. But the idea that, that it might be practical to use a robot, for example, to interact with old people and to provide companionship, which is they've got a little fluffy bear called Fujitsu, which they're using with Alzheimer's patients. And it provides them, it de-stresses them and provides comfort. But, but then doesn't that take away from our humanity that, you know, we're not, surely it would be better if people were talking to people. I, I fully agree. Um, there are some certain issues uh, at stake here. Despite the weird looks, um, there's quite a few other ethical implications um, involved. For, uh, and you were hinting to that in the video that we saw, that we saw earlier. These are prosthesis, so these are artificial body parts. And they are, none of them are as good as the real thing yet. However, people who've had accidents and lost control over their limbs have chosen electively to amputate their numb limbs and have them replaced with prosthesis because the prosthesis would offer them more functionality. However, what if uh, in a not so distant future we'll have artificial body parts that are actually better than well, natural body parts? You know, if we have super hands, super legs, will people choose to you know, amputate healthy limbs to have them replaced with better artificial ones. But, but isn't there another potential, which is that, for example, you have a frame of a body that has certain parts that are, are still functioning, mm -hmm. but has come to the end of its useful life in lots of other ways, yes. which you can in some way replace. And mm -hmm. you extend a life perhaps by 20 or 30 years. Now, Stephen Hawking's life amazingly continues. But you can imagine, perhaps, a situation in which somebody else in another kind of a condition could be extended to 120 or 130 or more. Are you, are, you, are you not worried by that? I am worried about that, because what it comes down to is access to this kind of technology. And I think, to that regard, Stephen Hawking is a good example, because in his case, his medical care is very, very expensive. It takes a lot of financial resources to extend life. If we have an artificial heart in the near future that will be able to extend life in a better way than this can, it would be a very, very expensive device. And our societies will be unable to provide everyone as part of a healthcare system with such devices. So it will come down to the question, who can afford such devices if there is no regulation at all? And that will give money and an even greater societal impact than it already has. Well, no, if the bionic man is not a man who alarms you, what would, what does alarm you? Well, I've already said that, but, but there are things I could say about this. I mean, bionics is very good for helping people mm. as a therapy, mm. uh, like my glasses are a therapy, but when it comes to enhancement, then we have to start worrying about it ethically. Uh, do we want people to have their limb removed so that they can put, as you said in your introductory video, so that they can put another hand on? And then will we get a society where people are actually forced to do that because um, they won't get a job otherwise? So you want to, you're in India, you want to work in a coal mine, but if you to allow you to work in the coal mine, you've got to get this funny hand fitted. Not sorry, I don't mean to offend you. Well, well let, let's go a stage further. You wrote about some concern about the Google Glasses. Yeah, well, I think, it's, I think it's very interesting because of what you're saying is that be, because the, the tools in themselves are wonderful, but they're, they're, are, the, the way that we use technology is not symmetrical. And some people, those who are more privileged to start off with, will have greater access to it, will have more money, and will sort of become the sort of supercharged, super immortals. So my moment of epiphany was when I saw um, Sergey Brin with his little Google glasses. And... Um, he went, it was, at, um, it was at the TED conference in America, and he, he went on this little, um, there was this sort of game they had with um, emotive technology, it scanned your brains, and it, so it's, um, it uh, tested uh, what your mind power was like, how well you could focus. Anyway, I watched Sergey do it, and he leapt to the top of the leaderboard, he was number two, and, um, and then I had a go, and um, I was incredibly mediocre, and I have no focus whatsoever, uh, unsurprisingly it turns out. And I just thought, well, of course, so Sergey's there with his Google glasses, and 
they're going to turn in him into a sort of a semi-cyborg. But he's going to be a really good one because he's super intelligent and you know, he's built a million, uh, billion dollar company. Whereas I'm going to put them on and I'm not get, they're not going to increase my capabilities. But, but to hang that on level. a minute, is there anything so very different between equipping William Shakespeare with a quill pen and some paper and equipping somebody very, very bright with a pair of uh, a Google going, glasses? I think, I think there, there isn't in a sense, but it's just going to increase our inequality. So that the human problems that we have, which is access to which is social justice and the inequality of wealth, etc. I feel that that potentially is going to be increased by this access to technology and, and lack of access to this But you technology. could argue that everything that human beings have ever invented, ever developed, has increased people's inequality. You might have a car. There are people in Namibia who have never seen a car. That's right. And I think, I think well, I think and that's the things that we have to think about. That we have human problems, and technology isn't necessarily the answer to those. That there, we do have to think about the way that that's applied. But then, what do you do? You shut it down. And say, Please do not develop anything else because inequality is going to flow from it. I think I don't know. I mean, it's I think a very strange line of argument. Actually, you know, we've got weapons that kill people, so let's make more weapons that kill people. I mean, it's a very odd argument that we've done this up till now, so let's let's make it worse. We've got social inequality. Let's amplify it more yeah. because we had it before. But it's a very you, odd you, kind you, of you argument. You can talk about military technology. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not robots that kill people. It's people who want to deploy robots that kill people. Yes, that's correct. So it still comes down to human choice. It's a you know, human we've choice. had two wars of choice in the last 10 years, during which robots have been deployed. Yes. But you can't blame the robots. You can blame well, the people not. who decided to have a couple of robots. wars. Of course you can't blame robots. It's always humans. But, for instance, using a robot that makes a decision to kill people really muddies the water about accountability, which is really crucial for the laws of war. Yeah. Uh, also, for the laws of war, it's crucial that we can discriminate between combatants and civilians. There are no AI systems that can do that. We can just about tell the difference between a human and a car at the moment. There's no sense of proportionality and no one to hold accountable. It could be the manufacturer, it could be spoofed, it could be hacked, so we don't know who's in there. My robotic um, relationship with the app has uh, ceased to function. I wonder whether somebody would like to pick it up and plug me in. Um, but I'd quite like to, I'd quite like to pick up I'd like on, some on, on something else there, uh, if I may, which is uh, Carl's point about uh, care robots, and because I work a lot in the ethics of robotics generally, and the kind of things that you have to worry about, they could be very good for assisting people and helping in the task of care. Um, even then, you've got things like a £60,000 robot going around a care home at the moment looking to see whether people have drunk their water. Somebody in Sheffield has come up with a little beer mat that flashes a light when you haven't drunk your water that costs a quid, right, so it doesn't take up resources. Hmm. But the main things you have to worry about are things like human dignity, hmm. privacy, accountability. And, uh, you know, there are lots of human rights issues involved. And the thing but about it is... But in that sort of way, you're, you're describing an architecture which requires human beings to make decisions exactly. about the future. Yes. Now, some human beings got together and made a yep. decision about building this robot. Yes. But in so doing, they did not set out the architecture of the world into which this robot was going to function. Yeah, but this is just a demonstration robot. It's not much of a robot, really, is it? It's well, a it's a terrific pieces, robot yeah. in the sense that it generates... It's a bunch of bionic pieces, but as a robot, it's not going to do can much. I, <laughs> sorry, can I join, can I join yeah. in briefly on this? Um, uh, because you were saying uh, earlier, or you were implying earlier, sh if all of the, this has an ethical implication, should we stop developing certain technologies? Should we you know, say to science, OK, this is OK to invent, and this is not OK to invent? And... Um, I would like to allude at a concrete example from the TV program during which this thing here was, was created. When we visited a lab at the University of Southern California, they had developed a chip. It's already there. It, goes, it will go at some point in people's brains um, in order to restore memory function to people with Alzheimer's. They are already testing that on rats. They put it, but they also tried it on healthy rats. And when you put this chip into the brain of a healthy rat, you get a super rat with a memory capacity beyond the memory capacity of a normal natural rat. And this already exists. So I was speaking to one of the scientists who had been working on this for more than 13 years in the windowless office. And I asked him, well, should we do that? Should we put these chips into people's brains? And he looks at me and he says, honestly, on camera, he says, I don't know. 
And so apparently that, that thought had never occurred to mm. him whether there are any sorts of ethical implications. Well, uh, so apparently so, uh, at least some part of science is not asking these kinds of questions and therefore I think it's important to have debates like this. Yes. We can't provide answers mm. to these questions exactly. here on this panel, well, somebody, but we need to ask Somebody has contributed holding, very nicely. It's not this. holding back though. The point is it's exactly. not holding back science. Exactly. The point is you have ethical discussions about mm. the best application of the technology Precisely. rather than let it jump And that's on a point you. made by the audience. Turning down the wick on technology doesn't work. So we yeah. need to think about controls and regulation, yes. which doesn't actually work either. So perhaps no. Asimov's future is inevitable. I'm sorry, I was distracted by the question yeah. whether a human or a robot picked out our oh, socks. I'm sorry. Apologies. Hello, my dear chap. Uh, well, in a sense, he, he chimed with this issue. But what we actually got to a very, very interesting point, which is this question of the chip. Yes. Now, for example, it's been possible in Switzerland, in particular, who've led the way on this, for people with Parkinson's disease have quite a complex yes. brain operation in which I think monkey glands were actually introduced into some part of the brain, somewhere up here, um, and it has had a profound impact on people with severe cases of, of Parkinson's. And let's transpose the monkey glands into a chip which is capable in some way of regulating the spasms that create Parkinson's disease. Is it ethical to introduce the chip to control Parkinson's disease. Yes. Well, yes. of course it's ethical, but, uh, there are but Noel has already said that. Chips the, right. the, the difference okay. here. Let me, let me ask the next, next question then. Is it ethical to introduce into a part of the brain a chip to control which television channels you wish to watch? <laughs> <laughs> or indeed to link you to the, to the internet. I think it would be very what? sad if I had an operation in my brain so I'd have a remote control in my head rather than doing that. <laughs> well, no, but it, 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 I, I'm, I'm suggesting that with your Google glasses and your chip, yeah. you might be connected at all times to the internet. Would that be an ethical development of, of, of chip technology? Well, it depends. Too broad a question, really. You'd yeah. have to be more, a little bit more detailed to know what the ethical implications are. But you see, I mean, there's at, nothing the, immoral at the end of the day, that, we're not talking it? about science anymore. Yeah. We're not even talking about regulation. We're just talking about ethics. Yeah. And are scientists the best people to talk about ethics? Well, certainly, um, business people are not always the right people to talk about ethics. Because I was <laughs> under the impression that if we leave all of these it's decisions true. to engineers and business people, as soon as there is a market, as soon as there is money to be made, uh, then a, a lot of questions that I think you and I would ask are being put aside if there is a lot of money to be made. Mm. Uh, because at the moment, these processes here, they are absolute niche products for the very few who require them. Uh, but if they come to a stage of their development where they are available for a mass market because they appeal to everybody, because they, ex they augment human capabilities, we're talking about new markets that don't exist today. Mm. Uh, so a technology that can create new markets, and whenever technology can create a new market in and itself, it is of course very, very appealing. Uh, to the business world, and, and, and that's why we need to have discussions. So you're bound to look, in the end, to history. And, you know, there will be people who will argue that splitting the atom wasn't a great idea, right? I mean, what yeah. good has it been to us? Uh, well, of course, it's, it's cured a lot of cancer, um, but it's also created a nuclear arms race. So what do you do about these? You're concerned about robotics because of their military application. No, That's not the just thing. that. I mean, but it drives you more surgery than as else. well. All policing, surgery, child care, elder care. There are so many applications coming online now. But as somebody says years. here, wouldn't employing robots as nurses be more expensive than employing humans and higher, and higher the rate of employability, causing even more problems? I think, well, in Japan, for instance, in elder care, they're putting a lot of funding into elder care uh, robots because the population, it's about the demographic, really. Where are you going to get all the nurses from? They have a strange immigration policy. Uh, so where are you going to get all the nurses from? So the idea is to replace them with robots, which I don't like at all, because the whole point about human contact and needing love and these companion robots, they're OK for a bit. They're very good, the Kaparo robot, which I've got, which is a big seal that just looks as if it's having an orgasm all the time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it goes, you know, when you stroke it. Uh, but it's very good for people who are in panic conditions for 20 minutes of therapy or half an hour of therapy, but not to be left in, in their hands all the time as, as their main companion. So that's one of the worries there. But the whole point that you're making about science is that science can progress, but we shouldn't be caught off guard the way we were with the internet. 
but we will be caught off guard because there are people, there are scientists, roboticists working now in something called uh, value sensitive design. So the idea is you design the robot so that it can be used ethically. But the problem is once the technology goes into the wild, as it were, it can be repurposed, it can be used for lots of different things, you know. I mean, you could use a bionic man. I suppose I put a chip in his head and now I can remote control him. But he doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that is a very alarming potential. I mean, it's not only just a, a chip potential. in this chap's head. He has no soul, but he, 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 he may know it. See, it's not just the potential. Uh, with my new prosthetic hand comes uh, an iPhone app that lets you select the different grip patterns that go beyond what you can do with your nerve signals. What's, so if, what's to stop someone downloading the app here and controlling your hand? Oh, nothing, actually. It's on the App Store. You can all download it right now. <laughs> So if we, so if we can just simulate, though, so if I, no, it's not password. That's it the thing. Isn't. So if so I, I just give this to you, yeah. push any of these <laughs> buttons and see what my hand does. Sue, see, you're controlling me. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is genuinely alarming. It is because that thing is connected to the internet, right? And now potentially, and yes, yes, I think we, you've made the point. <laughs> <laughs> is it tiring? No, it's weird. <laughs> Yeah. That is one of the most alarming experiences I've ever had. <laughs> See? So it's not, th these are not just hypothetical questions. We're already there. So add more things and you murder someone. Was it you or was it John with your iPhone? It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Well, I mean, this has taken us into a completely devastating and terrifying territory. Well, we have remote control. We have the HIMEMS project, which is the Defence Advanced Research, mm -hmm. you know, the research wing of the Pentagon, have the HIMEMS project where they're remote controlling insects now. Mm -hmm. Uh, for espionage, so uh, you could remote control Let's just track mammal. back for a moment, because we've got a situation here where a manufacturer has let loose on the internet an app that can control his arm. Mm. That does not seem to me to be a clever idea. Where's the <laughs> regulatory <laughs> process here? Well, you have, hang on, uh, you have to, well, you have, I have to be precise here, otherwise the manufacturer would probably kill me. Yeah. Um, oh, literally. Um, <laughs> So, hey, well, at, the moment, no, you have, uh, at the moment he's got that delicious choice between paying you for the amazing plug that you've given them, uh, or, or indeed uh, no, 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 imprisoning you. Listen, you can, you, can all, you can all download the app from the App Store, it's called Biosim. However, it won't do much on your phones because in order to connect to the hand, you act, for that you don't need a password. But to activate the app on your mobile device, you need a, log, a, a password and a login with the company, right. and right. you only get that if you if you are if you are a, you know a certified really user of this hacker. device, you know, but still oh, that's possibly a oh, way a to circumvent it. I do it. apologize, Prime Minister. My hand's been hacked. Yeah. <laughs> it's at trade shows where we pre where we demonstrate this technology is really weird because if you open the app, it gives you a selection of hands you can tap into because you know there is of course more than one at a trade yeah. show booth. Uh, but but hmm. uh, quite seriously, what is the regulatory setup? for the relationship between the internet and bionic arms? I, I'm not sure that there is one. Well, I mean, sure there isn't one. It, it seems to me that it does open all sorts of potentials. Uh, as you just saw, yes, absolutely. I mean, just, just supposing a malicious force got hold of this factory's, you know, um, software, what then? It wouldn't be they very difficult. It wouldn't be very difficult. They could hold, they could hold, they could hold the, the company yeah. to ransom. They could threaten to do all sorts of things with these hands. Yes. We're only talking about a hand here, but once you get legs and things, then, of course, it opens well, up even any, more Well, and anything problems. to do with the brain. Yes. You know, the Parkinson's disease chip, not that it exists, but could be adulterated to do other things. It does exist, actually. People are been using chips for the last 10 years for Parkinson's disease. Yes. But can I just give another concrete example of this uh, about all of the, the, the potential danger source in this technology? There is a lot of people with a severe case of diabetes who are equipped with uh, mobile little insulin pumps that automatically mm. give out yeah. certain doses of insulin. I was talking to Mark Goodwin uh, the other day, who's a, a security specialist at the FBI, and he told me about a malicious person who has come up with a Bluetooth cannon, a device that transmits a Bluetooth signal for about 20 meters that gives everyone, uh, every pump uh, in, in, in the vicinity of 20 meters, the command to set off a lethal doses of insulin. You can kill 
people with this. And it's, it's already, it already exists uh, because these are Bluetooth, all, the, all of these insulin pumps have Bluetooth chips in them and they're very, very vulnerable. And suddenly, hacking can kill people. But I'll be honest, Bertolt, I thought we'd sat down here Sorry. to listen to you extolling the new frontiers of what was possible and pushing on to ever greater achievement. And it's you, in fact, who are giving the most alarmist accounts of what is possible. Uh, apologies for not living up to my no, no. expectations. Uh, <laughs> we didn't hire you to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I guess my main, my main point is, yes, this technology is brilliant. I'm so glad that I have it. It not only has this prosthesis given me much more functionality than my previous one, it has also given me a much higher feeling of, of self-esteem in comparison to my old one, because the old one was ugly and clunky, mm. where mm. I think this one is actually pretty cool. So not only has it given me more functionality, but it also had a tremendous positive psychological impact well, it, on it, me. It, However, with this technology comes a price. Um, uh, there are all these questions involved that we saw in this program, in the very demonstration that we just have. Uh, by wearing this all the time, I'm making myself super dependent on this technology. When I'm not wearing my prosthesis now, I really feel incapacitated. I didn't have that so much before. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying here, there's two sides to all of this. It's not just black and white. There's shades of gray. And, and we need to accept that, and we need to find ways of dealing with that. We've seen its relationship with the app, but well, what's its relationship with your brain? How is it connected to your brain? It's not connected to my brain. Um, there are two electrodes on the surface of the skin that pick up EMGs, electric muscle signals, from the muscles that would uh, do this movement if there was a hand. So what you learn is to retrain your brain to, where, to do this, and then it does this. Mm -hmm. So you, f you basically learn to flex a muscle in your residual limb, and then the prosthesis opens and closes. So at the beginning, when you learn to use a technology like this, it's a very conscious process. You have to think, okay, I'm flexing muscle there, so something happens there. And after 10 years, it completely proceduralizes. You think open, and it opens. And therefore, the prosthesis has become a part of my body image. So what is the potential? Where, where, where does this journey end? Has it ended where it is now? No, no. Could it play the piano? N this one, no. It could not <laughs> no, no, play the piano. No, no, but one piano. day. Potentially. The, the engineering challenge is not to build a fully articulate hand. The challenge is to control all the, the thousands of different movements that you can make with an artificial hand to interface with the brain. The interface between the technology and the human body is the main engineering challenge at the moment. But as part of the program, um, I was able to try on a $150 million uh, artificial arm prototype that was built by the um, US Army. Uh, and that has 27 degrees of movement. It has pattern recognition. And with that, you know, I could do these, after 15 minutes of training, I could do these all sorts of movements, which was weird because the arm was one and a half meters away from me and I was sitting on a stool and it was kind of moving mm. over there. Um, so, and if this, so, yes, of course, this is not the end, it's just the beginning. So, he, he's given us a picture of the amazingly positive potential breakthroughs and some of the really dire possibilities. Yes. <laughs> Where are you coming from? Well, a mixture. I mean, uh, as I've said all the time, it's a matter of there are great things that technology can give you, but we must be alert and be cautious and be aware of the problems as well. And we must explore those, which is what we're doing here. So we must continually sit down and think very hard. I mean, thinking about ethical issues isn't just a matter of going, oh, I have an opinion about something. It's really thinking it through. What are the implications of this? And it's very difficult to get it right, but we must at least try all the time. But and we mustn't let things like this hold us back. I mean, we talking about remote control. I mean, th those are things that could be fixed, providing we think about it. Carol, my sense, though, is that uh, you feel things are already being done that are of questionable... Well, I think you don't really have to look at the future, do you, to see the ways that this technology is being used for harm. And that's not the technology which is doing the harm, it's mm. the people. So drones in Pakistan, for example, um, I think we would feel that harm much more, obviously, if the Pakistanis were sending drones into Surrey and accidentally killing small children. We, we might actually kind of have a bit more of a debate about that and wonder actually if that is really what we want to be doing. And, you know, somehow that's it, that isn't a massive live issue which we are concerned about and looking to see where that will go. And um, 
I think we need to feel that, I suppose. We, we, you know, it, it'll take something before we, we sort of feel those questions more urgently. But you see, if you take the drone, and one doesn't want to have a discussion about drones, uh, because that, that can be had in any arena, but if you take drones, for example, what is the difference between a pilot at 60,000 feet, unable himself or herself to actually see the target, but looking at it on a screen and pressing a button when the uh, traction or whatever it is is lined up on it, um, and somebody 6,000 miles away are doing exactly the same thing. They're neither of them at risk. Mm. Well, I think, that's, I think this is the really um, interesting question, well, isn't you, it? Because you can get an anti-aircraft missile, for instance, can knock you out. Uh, well, that's always assuming the Taliban have, the drone. <laughs> have anti... Well, yeah, so anyway, that's, uh, that's, I think you shouldn't open that issue no, fact, I'm not because gonna, it's uh, too big an issue. But I, I think at the end of the day, we've had a discussion about robots, informed by robots, yes. informed by artificial intelligence, but in fact, we've come back down to the question of human beings. Yes, always. Um, think, but, uh, but it sounds to me as if you two are still potentially worried that we come to a point at which it won't come down to human beings because we will have lost control. I don't think we'll lose control of the technology, no. We won't let that happen. Why, in what sort of sense? Do you mean like Terminator robots roaming the earth and very you know, heavy-duty artificial intelligence? I don't think so. But what will happen is... Why not? As, Why not? I just don't see it happening myself. I mean, I'm, I could be completely but wrong. Did you, did you expect to be able to download an app from the internet and control his arm? I mean... <laughs> yes. You know, it's a question of what... <laughs> what Frankly, yes. I oh, could have did. predicted that a while ago. But the future is not really my period, so I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I, don't like to, I don't like to probe too far. I can tell what's going on over the next 10 years, and beyond that mm. is fantasy. I love science fiction in my fantasy life, but in my day job, mm. I don't. But what, the one question you haven't asked, which I think is very important, is if you start building these bionic things and they're keeping people living for longer, at what point do they cease to become a human? That so it's a big seems, question. Seems a open. big and rhetorical <laughs> question. You can have the last word, Bertrand. <laughs> I, that is a too broad question uh, to, uh, to, uh, to answer in a, in a brief sense. I think it has a lot to do with you know self-awareness and the potential to feel you know uh, compassion and a social connection with other human beings. But that's probably as as little as can, I can say to the point at the moment. But I'd like to thank all three of you, um, well, all four of you, actually. I mean, uh, I'd like to thank all four of you very warmly for a very interesting discussion. And I'd like to thank you for your questions, points, and attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.